kind of surprising that we we follow the rules, even if they don't make sense. The IRS could be considered an oppressive organization, yet we all still pay our taxes. So, so I, I have this great faith that the state will become the most oppressive beast on the planet, and and I don't think the state is um, sovereign. I think the state is is at this point gone global. I think that one of the ways to ponder it is if you say, okay, who runs the world? And the answer um, has got to be the people have all the money. Uh, the banks have all the money. They create all the money. They write. This is the thing Bitcoiners don't like at all. At all. Gold, yeah. gold bugs don't like it all. Um, but but that what that also means is that um, J.P. Morgan is not a U.S. based com com company. Mm -hmm. Citigroup is not a U.S. based company. These are global companies. These have no. There are no borders yeah. on these guys. And as a consequence. The central banks are borderless too. So if you think the Federal Reserve is acting in our interest as as American citizens, you're delusional. Hello, welcome to the show. Uh, Dylan, how are you doing? Uh, Dave is going to be in a second with us. Uh, great to have Close you. Close the door. <laughs> this is a great I've consolation. Um, <laughs> so Dave, how are you doing, man? Um, it's has I'm been good. A while since we talked together with well, who was it? Uh, Eric Kaysen and Eric Vasco. That was a real deep down, uh, deep down the rabbit hole about well, about some aspects which we're going to talk about. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, Dave, let, let's start off because uh, you got a little bit of what do you call it? Um, you, you made some statements on Twitter and you got sort of a backlash by Bitcoiners that, you know, you said, you know, I think it's a very val valid concern. You said that, um, you know, which have always, you know, repeated your concern that it's um, the authoritarianism, the rising authoritarianism, which I think, to be honest with you, it's much more than authoritarianism. If we think about it, I think it's a much bigger problem that we have, structurally speaking, whether we talk about the executive system, judicial system, the self-appointed entities, you know, that are giving the directions, you know, if you look at all the factual evidence and behind the curtains, what's going on, it's a little bit more than authoritarianism. So um, the reason I'm saying is, is because I think um, even if we, res if, even if uh, the fiat system self-cannibalizes itself, I think it was a terminology that Dylan used in one of his articles. Um, is it possible that um, that even if Bitcoin somehow um, you know um, somehow uh, becomes you know the the global reserve currency and becomes you know um, the medium of exchange and the unit of account and uh, you know the store of value and becomes really in, entrenched in in a you know would it be nation states like El Salvador? Uh, could it be still, could we still have the problem? And this is what I want to talk to you about and want to have your opinions, your thoughts about this. Like, could it be that the structure is so, like has become so dictatorial, so tyrannical, so centralized, whether we're talking about the central banking st structures, the Bank of International Settlements, the World Economic Forum, the nation states, the governments, is it still possible that it will be a really, uh, what should I say, difficult or maybe even uh, a bloody challenge to you know to um, uh, to have to transition into a peaceful egalitarian system uh, you know uh, rooted in a sound monetary system such as Bitcoin. You asking me or uh, yeah, or Dylan? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so so one of the oddities is is that the uh, the argument for Bitcoin is that you get to circumvent authoritarian systems. And, and at the same time, um, the rising authoritarianism, and I, I keep groping for a more pejorative term, but I end up with something like Nazi. And that has such pejorative connotations already that, that I, my wife says, don't say Nazi. And I go, what do you want me to say, fascist? I don't know. Um, it, it is the very rise of those systems that tells me that, that, um, that there's going to be a brawl. And I, I keep telling the Bitcoiners this. And I keep telling them that, you know, and I was listening to something this morning. So, for example, the colonial pipeline, some of these uh, ransomware attacks, uh, the, the claim is the FBI got all the Bitcoin back, right? How? 
I can I can hop in here if you want. Um, I yeah, Dave, I listened to your I listened to your pod with, with Preston and Greg Foss. Pretty awesome, um, awesome riff you guys had. Um, and I agree with a lot of the, the points that I mean that all three of you brought up um, in terms of the colonial pipeline and just how Bitcoin kind of could circumvent authoritarianism. Um, you know, I think honestly with with the pipeline, it was no different than just like a bank seizure or you know a frozen bank account um, with with Bitcoin and like the cryptography of the protocol. Um, there's there's no way to I guess like hack na- like you know the native protocol or. Or, or an address or, or a wallet if, if it's in, you know, secure self-custody. But if I send Bitcoin to Coinbase that was acquired um, illegally, it's it's pretty easy because of the transparent nature of the, you know, the, the network of the blockchain to, to see where that goes and also to, to seize it if, you know, you have these exchanges. There are centralized um, exchanges. There are, you know, entities that operate on the network um, that will work with, with the state or whatnot. But um, ultimately... You know, at the base layer of of the protocol, the base layer of this monetary system, it's the fact that it is mutable and that no one can change it. And so, you know, you'll have scaling layers above that where you know there is government interference or um, you know nefarious activity. But ultimately, what like the immutability of Bitcoin is is at the base layer. So, so if I wanted to buy Bitcoin and do so completely anonymously, I can do it, but I have to be very careful about how I do it. Is that correct? Um, uh, well, more or less. So, I mean, there's, um, the lightning network, um, is a lot more privacy focused and, and that's come a long way. Um, but ultimately if, if you can, you can buy Bitcoin with cash, uh, you know, a peer to peer market, um, or you can do it, you know, through KYC, but they're always because like on the base layer, um, there always is somewhat of a paper trail. Honestly, the, the best way to acquire, I guess, private Bitcoin would be to sell energy for Bitcoin. Um, uh, mining is, you essentially, you know, Kevin O'Leary called it, he called uh, mining like virgin coin, which is, you know, he doesn't really have a great understanding of the protocol, but essentially, um, you know, the best way to acquire Bitcoin that no one knows like who it is, is to acquire it through, uh, you know, via mining. So, you know, selling, selling electricity to the network. Uh, but that's not, it's not for retail, right? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's a couple of good points here where like you know you bring up that that there's going to be a fight and there will be a hundred percent, but I think ultimately um, you know with Bitcoin and just Bitcoin essentially being information, um, you know information is is unstoppable, um, and so you know there will be there will be um, you know a power grab, but ultimately the, the game in in my opinion and a lot of Bitcoiners' opinion, and you know you'll have some people that say this doesn't matter. Like, you know, it, like they, they can do nothing. And I think ultimately the, that kind of conclusion is derived from the kind of game theory standpoint where um, the incentives of Bitcoin um, and how the protocol functions, you know, not ensure, but I guess incentivize people to act in their own self-interest. And it, it essentially um, the network bootstraps because of greed. It bootstraps because you have, you know, a million and growing, you know, number of hodlers around the world that are all, selling their value for this asset and and you know because of that um it's working to to make the network stronger i, I it still sounds perforated to me um so let's say the western system and the west is going to work cooperatively right France is not going to break away from England. Is not going to break away from the United States. <laughs> so, you know, you can tell me that El Salvador is going, going, and turning into hodler, but, 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 you know, in the United States, doesn't like what El Salvador does. We go bomb them. I mean, it's just that simple. I, I, I was just listening to uh, an audiobook on Eisenhower's biography, and we didn't like Mossadegh, of course, and we took him out. We didn't like the the president of Guatemala. We took him out. And so, so El Salvador is a sitting duck. They happen to do something that the U.S. doesn't like. So, if there is a brawl, and it becomes uh, sovereign against uh, this newfound currency that threatens sovereign currencies and threatens the the, the sovereign based banking system, which one can argue is multinational, right? This is not U.S. Canada, um, uh, Great Britain, it's one banking system and, and they all work yeah. together. All you have to do is watch Mark yeah. Carney and watch, you know, we'll stop doing QE and all of a sudden the next Monday morning, uh, the, the Brits are doing QE or, or the, the, yeah. the European Union is doing QE. So you're, you're up against the entire banking system. Now, I can entertain the possibility that the banking system is fine by it. I, 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 I can't say for sure. 
what I can say is, is that, uh, that I want to be in a foxhole when, when they, if, and when they decide to go at it. Yeah. Cause I think it's, I, I I think it's that, a bloody mess. I think that's totally valid. Um, and you know, like, well, see, here's the interesting kind of, thing is your hodler buddies don't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that, that's the, so one of the, one of the things that I hear a lot of is I hear about how it's sort of, you're too old to understand boomer, right? I get the boomer thing. And I get it, actually. Um, one of the reasons I'm retiring pretty soon is because I realize I'm running Windows 95. Um, and, and I get that there's a younger generation that, 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 that sort of comfortably gravitates to a digital world like this that I don't. Um, what this younger generation appears they have no clue about, and I'm sure some do, but, but, but certainly most don't is the history of authoritarianism, the history of money, the history of banks, the history of things like this. And so they go, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. I would have said the Fed couldn't dump $20 trillion into the system. They did. I, I would have promised you that was not a possible solution to a financial crisis. No one, I, I have such an unbelievable web of connectivity that goes all the way from people who've run for president to, 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 to bankers, to CEOs of banks, you name it. No one saw the bailout come. And so when a bunch of 20-somethings or 30-somethings are all glassy-eyed over Bitcoin, say, you can't do this, you go, ah, just wait and see. Uh, history is history's filled with, with the pre- – you, you know, you say inform- you can't stop information. Don't tell a North Korean that, right? Don't tell, don't tell a Chinese person that. I, the Ruskies can know that they're under an oppressive regime. Yeah. So what? And we're so, so early. What? Right, Dave. I mean, would you? I mean, would we all agree we are too early? We are so early in this whole phase, and you know, I was just talking to my girlfriend also today. I was like, you know, if I didn't have a, if we, if we didn't have a child, we have a, you know, six, seven, almost seven months old baby girl. I'm like, if I didn't have a child, if I wasn't parent or father, I wouldn't probably wouldn't I wouldn't care so much. I would say, you know, I would just live my life the next whatever 30, 40, 50 years and just die and whatever comes after me. But when you have a child, you know, I, I know you have children, uh, Dave probably grown up, but I don't think Dylan does. <laughs> so you know, it changes everything. And I'm like, you know, Bitcoin is just you know the real I mean, you know, Dylan and I are both Bitcoin maximalists. I would say, you know, we are we truly understand and comprehend our trust in the monetary evolution of Bitcoin because there is no other choice. I mean, what other choice do we have to make this uh, quantum leap of transformation on every structural level that you can think of? You know, I'm thinking about, you know, the military industrial intelligence complex, the central banking complex, this whole shit show that's going on with the you know, this pathogenic, uh, you know, uh, bio weaponized uh, COVID thing, which, you know, I know you've listened to Dave, Dr. David Martin. I mean, he lays it like factually out, you know, what's really going on, this whole racketeering, collusion, corrupt, whatever fraudulent thing that's going on in, behind the scenes. And nobody's talking about it. I mean, where do we go from here? This is my question. I mean, where do, I mean, if by the time we reach hyper Bitcoinization, I'm really concerned as a parent, how is my child going to grow up in what kind of world? This is my concern. Can I, can I, I hop in here real quick? Yeah, hop in, please do. Yeah. So uh, kind of running it back a little bit. So, um, you know, you, you were talking about like a little bit, Dave, like the monetary history, right? And so like if we just rewind it back like 90 years, 100 years, you have, you have, I mean, uh, in your talk with uh, Preston and, and Greg, you were just, you guys were laying out how we're in the, in the biggest debt bubble of all time, right? You know, mm-hmm. rates are at zero. Um, and the whole system is is essentially a Ponzi scheme, propped up on on ever ever cheaper money um, and and liquidity, and and one day it'll go bust. I mean that's and that's when you know it, it gets ugly. And so you know if we run, rewind it back to to the Great Depression, what happened? And and a lot of Bitcoiners will say Bitcoin is digital gold, and like kind of leave it at that. But um, I mean I I think digging into what that means is a little you know is important. So you know there's this huge private debt bubble, Great Depression. What do they do to the reflate? There was they they tried to keep the gold peg, but ultimately around the world they broke it. Executive Order sixty one hundred two, they seized the gold because in order to escape essentially in real terms this debt bubble, they needed to devalue the currency. And it's tough if everybody can can you know hoard gold in their basement. And so gold was was seized, um, which with, with with Bitcoin there are exchanges and there are centralized platforms. But ultimately, what what is so powerful about Bitcoin is is the self-sovereignty aspect to it where I can run on 
a, an old 2000 laptop or my smartphone or, or, you know, my own independent computer that's routed through Tor with no IP address, I can run the entire network, verify it and hold and hold all my wealth in my head. And so, you know, the argument about, um, you know, authoritarian crackdowns is real. And I expect, I think, you know, adversarially speaking, I, I expect it to come if, if and when shit hits the fan, because it's a mathematical certainty that in terms of our financial system, shit will hit the fan. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to, um, for, for me and for many Bitcoiners, it's what can you truly hold at this time? Like, I, I'm, I'm pretty young. I don't, I don't want to be buying equities at, you know, 200% or whatever market cap to GDP. I'm sure as hell not buying a bond. Honestly, if Bitcoin didn't exist, I would probably, I'd, I'd be buying a lot of gold. Um, so priced out of the real yeah. estate market, right? So, so I, I hold Bitcoin as something that one can't be inflated away, and, and that's and that's a mathematical certainty because I, I can run and verify the software myself. And two, there's no there's no kind of counterparty risk to it. There there can be if you hold it on Coinbase or you're, you're lending it out or anything like that. But in, a, in an executive order sixty one hundred two situation, um, you're going to have to go find hundreds of thousands, maybe millions eventually of self-sovereign individuals who will rather just die than hand over their, their Bitcoin. And ultimately um, there's going to be an exchange rate in every, whether it's black market or, you know, you know, white market in every planet or, or on every country on the planet, you know, in every jurisdiction around the world. And so, um, you know, that intolerant minority of, of crazy la laser eyed cultist hodlers, um, you know, in, in a situation where everything hits the fan, um, you know, they, they're not going to be subject to the same, the same kind of situation or, you know, at, at the scale of something in 1930, 33, when everybody's holding their gold in, in, in the bank vaults. My opinion. So then the question is, so they, they, they step on your throats, right? They attempt to step on your throats and they make uh, Bitcoin transactions illegal. So now you will be restricted to those who are willing to work in the black market. And if we have a complete and utter catastrophe, then that could be the equivalent of the person who sat on gold during Weimar Germany when everything else was going to hell. And so I get that. Um, but, but, um, but that's a very, that's drawn on an inside straight model. I was once told when I was worried about something, they said, don't ever, don't ever, prepare in a way that requires a disaster for you to be okay. And so I, I tend not to bet on the extreme outcome. The extreme outcome, I, I almost can't insure against. I say, ah, shit, I'll take 30 Valium and walk to the light and call it a day. Um, and and so, so then the question is, what if, it, what if it's just like, you know, we had a huge debt problem at the end of World War II, which I'm just now trying to wrap my brain around how they handled it. They, they basically financially repressed it away. In much the same way they're doing now, and uh, trying to do, yeah. it's something. It's something that I didn't really understand that well until fairly recently, and I, I probably don't understand it now. Um, but but I do worry that if Bitcoin gets sent to the black market, it's just a whole different world. And if I want to go to the store and buy groceries, it's not. I can't use the black market. Right. I, so the you normal know, world economy a, can be because you know Eric Ruskell and you know so many other Bitcoiners would tell you right now. Bitcoin was and has always been intended as a black market money. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, but, but the local supermarket is not going to take it if it's black market. I'll be able say, to buy something from you guys, but, 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 but if it's outlawed, if it said, look, $10,000, you know, 10 years in jail prison term, if you're using Bitcoin, then no legitimate business, no legitimate business plugged into the IRS, no legitimate business plugged into the system, no system, right? And, and the more digital the world gets, the more we're all plugged in, right? We've learned that about COVID, right? You speak up against COVID, you get shut down. Um, and and so, so in some sense, I think you at some level have to prepare for a world that, that's coming, not to completely circumvent it, but to work within it. I don't. I don't think you're going to be able to circumvent it. I, I, Bitcoiners can sell stuff to each other, but I think you know the S and P is not going to run on Bitcoin, right? That you're not going to be able to buy a car at the local car dealership with Bitcoin if 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 they outlaw it. I, I don't see how you can possibly do that. 
Okay, this is, this is, I think, the moment where we have to talk about jurisdictional arbitrage, incentivization game, game theory, you know, right. or nations like El Salvador. Like, we are talking already with my girlfriend and, you know, and, you know what are we going to do? I mean, are we going to emigrate? Are we, where are we going to, you know, where are we going to move to? You know, where do we have freedom? Where are we free, you know, and, and work in a, in a you know, uh, a deflationary localized economy rooted in Bitcoin? I mean, that would be great, of course. But, I mean, Dylan, what's, what's your take on that? I mean, isn't that, uh, is, wouldn't that be the progression level? Like, if, if it's really gets prohibited, I mean, if, if it gets penalized. Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of different things here. Um, one, in, you know, in the situation where, where Bitcoin is, is outlawed in the U.S., um, I think every single day that it's not, we kind of stray further from that probability, in my opinion. I mean, we have, there's a, a, a hardcore laser ad Bitcoin maximalist on the Senate Banking Committee, um, more and more Congress congressmen and, and House representatives are speaking up against, like, about Bitcoin being, um, you know, like kind of representing the American ideals. There are, there obviously is the, the Brad Shermans of the world who, 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 who's right. He says, Bitcoin is a threat to our, to our dollar hegemony. And he's right. Um, but I think, I think ultimately, um, you know, especially with, with the U.S. as kind of this global reserve currency, I don't, I don't think at the moment we have the option to kind of close our capital markets to the rest of the world, one, and, and, and Bitcoin has liquidity in every jurisdiction in the world. Um, and, and two, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, if like Ray Dalio says, the biggest threat to Bitcoin is, is, is its success, right? So, you know, if, if in, in Turkey, they ban the dollar or they, you know, they restrict dollar access to bank accounts, well, what happens to the exchange rate? It, it absolutely, like the, the lira collapses. And so I think ultimately a U.S. ban or, or a, you know, a state ban, wherever it is on Bitcoin um, is one of the, one of the biggest uh advertisements for for bitcoin it's saying hey you you kind of need this um and so um you know the financial repression that we saw in the 40s um you know with with this liquid monetary asset that's accruing value all across the planet that has a that it essentially is a commodity it has production cost um i just it and with it with a direct incentive for every energy producer on the planet to to adopt it it's instead of flaring your gas or instead of you know, letting, letting your grid just, you know, the energy efficiency, just have it go to waste. Well, you can, you can turn that into money and you can sell that for dollars or, or euros or yen, but um, there's just kind of this incentive all over the planet to, to adopt this thing. And so I think, um, you know, a ban is probable. I don't know what it is. I, it's definitely a non-zero chance. Um, but at that point you have to kind of consider, um, you know, in the long game, what wins um, centralized systems or decentralized open systems. And we kind of saw that early in the days of the internet where you had, you had, you know, everyone trying to build the companies trying to build their own protocols. Uh, but what won, even though it was kind of slow and clunky is like TCP IP. Um, and so I think that's how I kind of think. And, and I think many people think of Bitcoin is that this decentralized system with, with no, with no rulers, with no, um, you know, like Michael Saylor is a big proponent, but the Bitcoin network will still continue to chug along if he sold or if, if he disappeared or, you know, was malicious. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, I think, I think more and more time passes on and we have more and more adoption. And honestly, the bigger the market cap grows, the more influential like, like Bitcoiners and, and, you know, like lobbying Congress will be right. We have, there's, there's more capital. Um, and I think, especially as these wall street guys get in a, a trillion dollar asset or at 700 billion today that's no joke and and it's starting to affect policy um in my opinion and if you look you know at the historical roots of the united states you know the founding uh, fathers or you know the principles <laughs> I mean, how much how much percentage of the population did it take to you know to to initiate the revolution? Was it like three, four, five percent? You know, like uh, this is sometimes it concerns me sometimes because there's so many like gun. You know, there are so many people in the United States like you know who are holding on to their guns. What is it like three hundred million people? But they can't even stand up to to the you know to the to the dr super draconian. I mean, measures they've taken with the lockdowns. You know, destroying businesses, destroying lives and existences. This is something. That is somehow a schizophrenic in my, you know, in my, from my perspective. But you know, I, what I'm trying to say is that how much, like, how many people would it really take? Is it like three, four, five percent of the Earth population of, a, of any, you know, nation states population, to, you know, to push this forward, to push this you know, freedom-seeking? 
Well, this is a reminder, speaking of being entrenched, I mean, gold was guaranteed by the Constitution. <laughs> and they took it out at the kneecaps. So, so um, I once asked a constitutional scholar, did the Supreme Court ever knowingly ignore the Constitution? He said, not that they'd admit. I said, what about, the, you know, Ban and Gold? And he said, yeah, that's the classic case. So they decided when it was in their best interest to outlaw gold, they did, even though it was, it's explicit in the Constitution. They didn't pass an amendment. They didn't. They just said gold's gone. And so when I they banned gold in 1933, what was what was the dollar exchange rate? You know, it was like it was like 33 bucks, right? Uh, well, it, it previously was not 33, but it had been creeping was, up. Um, I can't remember yeah. if 33 is where FDR had taken it to. Um, like 25? I, think, around I think after he banned it, he, he cranked it right up to 35 instantly. I, I think so, he banned it, collected it, and then upped it. But you couldn't know. Yeah. That. So but you couldn't know the, the, the lesson, though, is that a government decree doesn't wipe out the monetary value. Uh, right? In the United States, it did. I mean, you, you, you couldn't trade it. You couldn't sell it. You, it was all black market. Um, you can't find a legitimate price for gold in the United States cited until you get to the 1970s when they opened it back up and then it opened up at around 40 something. And then it rose from there. So the gold market was dead. It was completely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I just, I just think that there's a fundamental difference, um, between, between a monetary metal, um, that because like, you know, I guess. Uh, certificates of deposit and the fractional reserve banking system arose because of gold's fundamental flaws, right? And the fact that it's a it's a clunky rock that's not easily divisible, and it's not easily portable, and in no, a that, that, no, 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 that, no, that's not it. Got, not a bit. There's there's gold's divisible by virtue of of the exchange rate, right? I mean, a, a treasury is divisible. Everything is divisible. My car is well, divisible. Can I, yeah. Well, like I'm, I'm just saying in a, you know, in an economy of scale, can I go buy a $2 drink or a $10 lunch or, or whatever, you know, the equivalent would be in gold pieces. And, and the reality is that that doesn't scale. Right. So, so paper money, I guess, emerged as a technological solution to that. Correct. Or well, but it, paper, well, paper money seems to have emerged as a depository receipt on gold. So, so yeah. it was denominated in gold. And so in that sense, paper money provided the divisibility. Um, silver, uh, there's a, a mine in Czechoslovakia in the, the 16th century that put out a ton of silver. And it gave economists this bizarrely misguided belief that flooding the market with money was, was advantageous. It wasn't. What silver was, was as a coin-based monetary system much more divisible than gold. So as coins, you're right, gold's not divisible. We can solve that problem completely. And so, so, uh, so gold is completely adequate. There's plenty of gold to run the monetary system. You just price it correctly. The reason the Brits had to go off the gold standard because they mispriced it. They came out of World War I. They wanted to uh, put gold exactly back where it had been before, and, and they, they couldn't because their, their, their uh, sovereign net worth did not begin to match the amount of gold they had. So they couldn't price, price the, the, the pound in the units of gold the way they tried. So, uh, so the U.S. tried to help them out, but eventually it just blew up because they didn't, they didn't do it right. They blew it. Uh, there is no amount of gold that's needed. And gold can be mined, you know, and so the, the growth of gold is uh, something like one and a half percent a year or something. That's, you know, it's a two percent, like, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And, and it, it varies. Elasticity, uh, Dave. I mean, it's, a, it's you know, gold has a relative. I'm not a big gold bug either, by the way, in case you had noticed. <laughs> I just said the feds could outlaw. Yeah. So, you know, I, yeah. it's not like I'm saying you should have gold, not Bitcoin. I'm just saying that they can step on any throat they want. Mine, yours. And again, the thing that troubles me about the Bitcoin movement is that you get this massive generation who seems to only see the upside and they see the miracle of the, the, the blockchain. I get it. They see the miracle of uh, dis, dis, being distributed. I get it. What they're, they haven't done is read enough books about what sovereign states do and what authoritarian regimes do and how these kind of problems get dealt with through history. And, and, and they're, you know, you, you get wars, you get all sorts of things that come out of these shenanigans. And so, so, so the Bitcoin crowd doesn't seem to understand how 
dangerous the state is. They seem to think that it's it's like uh, it's like you know people riding in the street right up until look at so they ride in the street all spring and they say oh we can get away with this right we can get away with this this is no problem but then you have the the January six riots right far less consequential than the riots all spring long they far less damaged it lasted one day there was no one shot no one killed by anyone in the riots they're all in solitary confinement the state has decided to step on their throats. So, so there's hundreds of people in solitary confinement because the state decided that riot was not acceptable. And boom, they're in jail. Boom, they're getting nailed. There's guys who are in jail for having done precisely nothing. Mm-hmm. And, and they fabricated charges, said you're up for 15 years in prison if we convict you, right? It's just, it, it's an authoritarian state. And so, so the hodlers somehow think that they can flaunt this autonomy, which I, I get the theory of the autonomy, but I, I don't believe in practice it's autonomous. But we haven't reached a critical mass yet, Dave. I mean, Dylan, that's cor- right. Correct me in the numbers. I mean, how mu- like uh, globally, worldwide, how many hodlers or you know, Bitcoin hodlers do we have? Hundred million, hundred fifty million? It's like nothing. That's peanuts, right? What if we reach a billion by 20, 2024, 2025? Well, as Dalio said, you know, your own success could be your worst enemy, right? So right now, the central bankers are just kind of looking through sort of scrunched eyebrows and thinking, what do we do about this? Um, they're not acting very, they're acting at about the same pace that the Supreme Court's acting about free speech on the internet, right? They, 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 they're, they're just watching. And they talk about having sovereign cryptos. And I go, that's the stupidest concept I've ever heard. If it's a sovereign, it's not a crypto. You guys know it. I know it. Everyone knows it. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, Zuckerberg comes out with what, the, the Libra or something? What was it? The what was Libra. It? Libra, yeah, and all of a sudden, like you saw some some people twitch a little bit because they go, "Oh man, that's a little too scary." Boom, where'd it go? It's kind of gone again, right? All of a sudden, that became no, we don't want that. It went away, and uh, and so uh, again, Foss and uh, and Pish kept asking me what price I'd buy Bitcoin at. It's it's not about price, it, and they they didn't. I don't think they heard what I was saying. It, it is about, I think Bitcoin's going to go through a battle. You guys seem to at least acknowledge that that's a very real possibility. Some, some don't. Some don't have the, they say, oh, they can't battle us, right? You know, yeah, you're going to get your laser eye shot out. Um, so I think you're going to go through a battle. And for me, my signing off on Bitcoin, one where I could just buy it, put it away, not worry about it, not feel stupid about it, uh, will be... Uh, when I think the hodlers have won the battle, and it's probably going to be beaten down, so there's probably going to be a price reduction involved. But when I when I'll say, "Oh my God, Bitcoin is here," but you haven't yet. You're like you're like an army that's amassing behind the lines, and and you got all your troops lined up, and your 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 divisions are doing doing exercises, and you're getting all ready for the fight. There has not been a fight yet. And I, I think there's going to be a fight. And I think that's when we're going to find out whether, whether we should own Bitcoin. Now, if, if you're buying Bitcoin as a speculative vehicle, it might be late by then, right? I, I actually looked at Bitcoin at 10 bucks a piece. I looked at it again at 67 bucks a piece, right? And so you can understand why I'm a little reluctant to buy the 30 or 60,000, right? There, there's a kind of a, uh, a human nature component to that. But, but, um, but somehow... At some point, I'll say, uh, okay, I'm, I'm now convinced. But I, I, I need to see you guys go to battle and convince me that you're going to come out of this one. And I, I, we haven't even talked about the risk of some new Bitcoin wannabe coming into view that for some reason is better. And, you know, you can say, oh, the network effect. Well, of all these, these weak-handed hedge funds, and the hedge fund guys are weak hands. You've got to admit that. The hedge fund guys will only own Bitcoin while it's going up. They will only own Bitcoin while it's making them filthy rich. They will not own Bitcoin the way you guys own Bitcoin, where you say, I'm holding it through thick and thin. You think Ray Dalio is going to hold on to Bitcoin through thick and thin? Now he's going to trade his ass right out of it. And yeah. and every one of those hedge funds is going to trade out of it if it becomes the bad trade because they have attention spans of a gnat. Yeah, Dylan wrote so a you're gonna- beautiful uh, Twitter thread on you know on how why it, you know it doesn't make sense you know to, to for people to make all these shorts what do you call it futures contracts or shorts um, and and you know in order to 
to manipulate the price of Bitcoin. Uh, but first of all, I want to say, you know, people should listen or re-listen to, to the interviews you've done, both of you, uh, with Greg Foss. Um, and I think Dylan was on the uh, Peter McCormick show, right? What Bitcoin did and 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 Dave was on Preston Pish. It was really, <laughs> they're, they're really super complimentary. I think you should, you, you, everybody should listen to that. So um, Dylan, can you, can you elaborate a little bit on the, on the long-term debt cycle and how do you think from that point on, you know, you talk about the debt ju du jubilee as a conclusion, how would that play out? I mean, all the concerns, can you like, in, uh, would you invalidate the concerns that, uh, you know, Dave has? No, I think, um, I think we, you know, we, we agree, Dave and I, um, even though, you know, this is our first time talking, um, follow, followed you, listened to, uh, listened to you on Marty Ben a few times, I believe. Um, and then, uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, uh, on Preston's podcast, which, which was fantastic. Um, and I totally agree with, with where we are in the, you know, the incumbent monetary system and how, you know, there, there is no way to sustain this. Um, you know, we're right. in the biggest, we're in the biggest everything bubble of all time. And, and I guess every bet essentially, um, you know, regardless of what you believe is essentially an outcome on how this ends. Um, and you can have shorter term bets or longer term, but um, everybody's placing their bets accordingly. Uh, and, and, you know, for the most part, everybody's levered long up to their, up to their head and in, in everything. Um, and so, you know, and, and we've seen, you know, debt cycles, both short and long term in the past. Um, and historically kind of gold's been that protection, but gold, like you said, got its neck stepped on. Um, and so I think the argument for most, for most Bitcoiners is that the neck of Bitcoin, you know, figuratively is the hardest to step on that we've ever, we've ever seen. It's the strongest force, um, or, or as tool for, for liberty and sovereignty, or at least financial sovereignty that the world has ever seen. Um, and because, you know, they're, even, you know, I guess the state can knock on my door or, or you know, knock on yours, but um, to do that at a global scale um, where even, you know, many of the largest holders and, and just like, you know, people who run the network, there's tens of thousands of nodes all over the planet, um, you know, mining all, all of this stuff. The fact that it is just distributed um, while, you know, decentralized and all that stuff kind of is a buzzword in the crypto space, quote unquote. Um, the fact is that it makes the it, extremely hard to, you know, I guess, step on some necks. Um, you know, we're talking about information being sent across the internet um, and that, you know, nobody can shut, there's no off switch for the Bitcoin network. So, you know, in terms of the long-term debt cycle, how does it end? Well, if it ends with a bust, um, which it, you know, which it will, and they'll print, you know, probably tens, hundreds of trillions of dollars, you know, during this time, if they want to keep, keep this whole system together, well, then it, then it comes down to um, what can you own that that can't be printed or what can you own that is not is not subject to whatever you know implosion comes next and so um, you know we've kind of run down the options but um, the the belief from bitcoiners is that it's a peaceful revolution um, and that there you know there will be some response but um, I'm gonna hold something that has a definitive production cost um, it's like you know Michael Saylor says thermodynamically secure. Um, that, you know, that's kind of a big statement, the, you know, the first thermodynamically secured monetary system. But the fact is, um, you know, you have all these people around the world selling energy and the, because of the difficulty adjustment and the halving schedule, um, the production cost of Bitcoin is going to increase because of, because of the incentives and because of, you know, if hash rate is increasing, I guess I would say, which it has for the last decade in parabolic fashion, then the production cost of Bitcoin will increase. And whether it's a white market or dark market, um, there, there will be an exchange rate for Bitcoin. And it, if this plays out how we think with this debt cycle and the, you know, this mad monetary experiment, um, then, then Bitcoin is probably something that you want to hold because of these assurances. The response or like the, the reaction from the state, the, there will be a battle. But I think the, the belief among Bitcoiners um, when you kind of come down to to first principles is that um, you know there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come, and that th there is ultimately no avenue over the long term to stop this thing, even though it it can be you know um, temporarily halted or, or not halted, but temporarily intervened with or attempted you know to to, to be meddled with. Um, nothing on the on the base layer can change. <laughs> Does that like? You know, I, I, I can't like, argue. I can't argue with it. What 
what we're coming down to is we're coming down to, in some sense, a great example is the, the masking, the COVID, the response. I, I find that science took a tremendous black eye during this pandemic. I think we saw the mm -hmm. authoritarian state stepping in and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, they seem to be winning. Yep. And so you've got all these people masking up and calling for masking up. And I'm, I'm, I'm battling on Twitter constantly about why, why, why are we masking up kids? Why are we not letting them back to school? And, and, and yet we're not. Yeah. And so, yeah. the, 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 so as, as, um, as Kevin said, um, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I kind of alluded to the fact that it's kind of surprising that we, we follow the rules, even if they don't make sense. The IRS could be considered an oppressive organization, yet we all still pay our taxes. So, so I, I have this great faith that the state will become the most oppressive beast on the planet. And, and I don't think the state is um, sovereign. I think the state is, is at this point gone global. I think that one of the ways to ponder it is if you say, OK, who runs the world? And the answer um, has got to be the people have all the money. Uh, the banks have all the money. They create all the money. They write. This is the thing Bitcoiners don't like at all. At all. Gold, yeah. gold bugs don't like it all. Um, but but that what that also means is that um, J.P. Morgan is not a U.S. based company. Co company mm -hmm. Citigroup is not a u.s based company these are global companies these have no there are no borders yeah. on these guys and as a consequence the central banks are borderless too so if you think the federal reserve is acting in our interest as as american citizens you're delusional no private I, I i can't mm -hmm. i can't now, there's no chance they're working on behalf of the American citizen. And so so uh, what we are debating basically is the, the collective power of this democratic currency that you guys love. And and my faith that the guys who have all the money and create all the money and want to have the right to do that continuously. Uh, what, I, what I have faith is that they will become brutal forces of nature and they will become tyrannical. And it's it's the very tyranny that Bitcoin and gold guys oppose that also represents the growing risk to gold and Bitcoin. And so it, it's it's it really feels like the, the trilogy of Lord of the Rings, and, you know, where <laughs> the armies are all lining up and facing each other. And so, something real bad's got to happen before this is over, in my opinion. Um, yeah. and, and again, what here, here's another thing, by the way, this is why boomers are not thrilled by Bitcoin. Um, anyone can go on the internet and watch some old guy fiddling with his Zoom trying to figure out how to make it work. And, you know, he looks like a complete idiot, you know, and you go, say, get a millennial in here. You know, I couldn't get my mic, my headphone working before the thing, right? There's a great example, right? Windows 95, right up in my skull. Um, the last thing I need is another asset class to worry about. In the sense that I'm going, these this digital code of Bitcoin is this really the tangible connection I have to some percentage of my wealth, and and so we're generally more comfortable with the banking system, even though we think it's an evil empire, than we are with with the idea of having some codes tucked tucked away. I don't know. Do you, do you guys keep your codes on hard drives? Where do you keep your codes? The guy, the guy buried his hard drive and lost a hundred million dollars. We're thinking that guy's an idiot. I, I I don't know exactly what he should have done, but the guy's an idiot to to lose all his Bitcoin codes. Although my guess is he bought them when they're about a penny a piece. It was a lark, and it was on his hard drive, and he forgot about it, and he didn't realize he was a hundred millionaire. And then his wife chucked him out. I knew a guy who put put diamonds in his tuxedo pocket, and his wife took his tuxedo to Goodwill. There there is no fully guaranteed way of preserving wealth that I know of. They can it can all be confiscated. And a friend of mine named Tony Deaton says, you know, he has a rule of three, a third gold, a third art, and a third real estate. And he talks about, and the real estate's interesting because the tyranny can take your real estate, just look at Cuba. But if Cuba comes back to the, to the first world in its own way, right? If Cuba comes back, there are gonna be guys flooding out of Miami with deeds to property. And they're going to go back and get their land back. And that's Deaton's argument that, that, that preservation of generational wealth is holding the deed to that land and just waiting for that deed to become valid again. And uh, I, I, that creeps me a little. Um, 
gold creeps me less. And uh, yeah, I own a house in a low real estate, low cost real estate area. And so I, I, it's about triple the size of the house I need. So one can say that I definitely went long residential housing, but I'm comfortable owning it. Hangs off the lake. It's beautiful. People will pay good money for it. I don't know how much good money, but um, Bitcoin is one of these things where it'd be in the back of my head going, ah, shit, you shouldn't get to it. You need some BPN, whatever, you know, you get all tangled up. And you guys who flip through your phone like it's no tomorrow and this old guy is going, no, I want to make an account, right? That, that really is kind of a barrier, I think. Yeah, I think I think it's totally valid there, um, and I agree. Like, I I think we agree on a lot of things. I agree that an authoritarian push is coming. I think, but ultimately, the generational the generational gap, while it is real, um, someone like myself, um, or you know, any like you know, a lot of the the crazy hodlers that are millennials, Generation Z, um, you know, Gen X maybe, um, but disproportionately, you know, of younger age, I think we do see a lot of this this authoritarian creep especially with COVID and how crazy the world has become, um, kind of seeing through this farce. Um, and, and I have to ask myself, um, you know, ultimately, you, you know, Jack Mahler's when he announced um, at, at the Bitcoin conference, when they announced that El Salvador was, and, and even though El Salvador is pretty small, right? Like 6 million people, $24 billion GDP. Like it's, it's really, it's really tiny. Um, right. But he announced, and it was the first sovereign nation. He said, um, like, I will die on this hill. And he was referring to, to big, you know, basically fighting this this global cabal of you know central bankers and 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 with everybody that has everything to lose if bitcoin succeeds right um and i think ultimately you know as as someone that's young and who who thinks about the future a lot i have to ask myself what world do i want to live in and ultimately um if i you know quote like figuratively die on this hill of of perf like choosing the you know the the chance of freedom and of a, of a free capitalist society, um, that's a bet I'm going to make ten times out of ten. Um, and so, whether you know whether or not we we win, well, we'll we'll see you know into the future. Um, but ultimately, I, it it doesn't seem like there there is any any other option. And so, um, is that is that you know um, being like hopefully like optimistic, maybe. Um, but you're in an age bracket where you can risk. Okay, so one of the problems with the current um, everything bubble, which I, I may be wrong, but I think the guy who coined that phrase was Jesse Felder, just for the record. I believe Jesse called it the everything bubble. Um, every asset's been bid up to record heights, whether it's the S&P, um, whether it's the bond market, whether it's real estate. It's just a, a ridiculous state of affairs. And so we agree on all of that. Um, as a young punk, and I say that with affection, um, you are in a, a very different world than a 65 or 66 year old boomer. So there's no more time averaging for me. There's no more sort of averaging into the markets for me. Um, and so now, now it's about wealth preservation, which doesn't rule out Bitcoin, but it, it, it shows you that there's a whole different mindset. So this is where you're supposed to, at this age, you're supposed to be going conservative, you're supposed to be trying to eke out a return above inflation that's not, that's not bad. Um, it, right now, it's impossible, in my opinion. The only way you're eking out a return right now is, is, is by virtue of the fact that the bubble is continuing to expand. This return, I'm positive, positive, as positive as you are in your views, will all be given back. And, and I, I, it'll be given back either through inflation or it'll be given back through a highly deflationary collapse of some kind. Or the most common way, um, and I use these stories on all the podcasts, it seems, but, you know, there's going to be a correction. And a correction, to me, sounds trivial. It's, uh, when I say a correction, I mean a big one. I mean a big soul-wrenching, pull your brain through your nostrils, Egyptian mummification correction. Um, and and, and you, the question I ask is, when was the last correction? And people say, oh, you know, March 2020, not a chance, <laughs> not a chance. So, so I, I, I define a correction as a, a significant correction in the price of the asset and a significant correction in investors' attitudes. And so 2020 
corrected no attitudes, none whatsoever. If anything, it reinforced very, very bad attitudes that you should just stay in this bubble at all costs, no matter what. That's what it reinforced. So you go, okay, so uh, 208, 209, I would say that was not a correction. Same message, stay in this asset bubble, keep going. You know, in, in 08, 09, at the depths of 09, the, the, the equity market reached historical fair value, the average valuation through the last century. It didn't get cheap. It was, you know, and I thought I was dreaming. I talked to Mark Spitznagel, who was considered one of the bright bulbs of the world. And he said, yeah, it was, it was a little below fair value for about a month. So people thought that we had been destroyed, not knowing that when you fall 35,000 feet, it feels like you're back to the earth fast, but <laughs> you could have fallen at 15,000. And, yep. and uh, so we didn't correct attitudes because people learned, hey, just hold on. The people who sold made the mistake. And so the question then becomes, when was the last correction? When was the last soul-searching adjustment of people's attitudes? And the answer was 1967 to 81. That was the last time that equity investors and bond investors were shown that there's bad, bad things that can happen to you if you own. And, and if you own the equity market from 67 to, to 81, you got destroyed. And if you own the equity market from 29 on, you got destroyed. And from 06 on, you got destroyed. These, these were the bad times. We have been historically above fair value since 94, since 1994. So you say, okay, set a new historical valuation or, or look at the fact that in 94 is exactly when the leverage started picking up in a big way. And so, uh, so the question then becomes is how do you protect against that? How do you protect against the expansion of the everything bubble and the possible violent prolonged contraction of the everything bubble and i don't have an answer for you i, I don't I, all i know is is that owning equities might not be the answer and well, yeah, uh, i think like i think when we, we like when you kind of have to ask is can it unwind and the fact that like it has to unwind it has to unwind well it, it has to it has to but in a fiat system where we're you know commercial banks, commercial bank lending creates money, right? When there's this deflation, when there is, you know, kind of a deleveraging where like inflation and deflation aren't exactly opposites where deflation is a, a balance sheet problem, right? It's a, it's a liability asset mismatch, right. which causes a fire sale and it's a reflexive right. move to the downside. And so, you know, in the, if in March, 2020, the Fed doesn't step in and buy, start buying junk debt, you know, and, and, you know, monetizing trillions of dollars, what happens? Well, it probably, it continues to unwind. And, you know, I, I don't know if it actually goes to zero, but there's a deflationary bust like no other. And, and literally because fiat is created through lending, well, the whole system might unwind. The banks go and solve and everything, you know, goes to all hell. And so, you know, I, I guess I, I constantly think when there is an unwind, how fast does, you know, the political incentives and, and just also, you know, the incentives that central banks have to continue to kick the can, you know, and, you know, I, I guess we're moving towards this kind of collectivism and um, I guess socialism, honestly, at a, at a global scale um, where you have, you know, politicians and political parties buying votes by promising stimulus checks and, and all, you know, all this. Well, how do they let it unwind, right? When, this, when the entire system is dependent on ever increasing credit expansion. So is that the reason um, that so, so, banks are pushing for central bank digital currency because they're trying to control whatever, you know, the the, uh, the economy, the velocity of money, or this whole unwinding maybe? Is that the reason? Or well, So interestingly, before Bitcoin showed up on radars, you know, so Bitcoin was cheapest when it was nuttiest and was it is most expensive when it's most credible, right? And that makes sense. So back when, back when only complete whack jobs owned Bitcoin, that's when you got it cheap, right? That's when uh, when only whack jobs were buying. When I was first buying gold, I was buying it from 290 to 280 to 270, and then finally the pain was too much, and I said, "Okay, I got to stop." There's there's four other people in the world who care about gold. Uh, I've got too much gold. I've sold all my Nasdaq stocks, but I can't buy any more gold. And I have people tell me now, "Oh, you know, gold was so easy to buy back then because it was so cheap." And I go, "There were five of us who thought it was cheap, and the rest thought it was worth nothing." <laughs> So, so it, it never looks good. When I bought Philip Morris and R.J. Reynolds, they, they were about to be destroyed by a lawsuit. Then I finally figured out they weren't going to be destroyed by the lawsuit. I put kids through college on that investment. Um, Bitcoin, 
Bitcoin right now looks like the solution. The problem is it's, as I said to Preston and, and Greg, um, if I were to make a list, not, have, not about Bitcoin, I, I've read tremendous numbers of books on manias and panics and, 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 and economics and you name it, markets. And, and if I were to make a chess list, checklist of, of the, the dozen items that you expect to see in a mania, Bitcoin gets every box. That doesn't mean it's a mania or it doesn't mean that it's not going to survive, but it's got retail, it's got enthusiasm, it's got craziness, it's, it's, it's a wild west market. It's, it's, there's hardly a box that doesn't get checked. And so right away, you got to go be careful here. Be careful. There's a whole generation of hodlers who I believe, I say hodlers because it makes more sense. You guys say hodlers. I, I don't, where's hodler come from? Where's the word hodler come from? It's Hod holding Bitcoin, comes from right? Yeah, as a, it was like this this old blog post that it was you know intense. So, so, it was so, so you're pronouncing it. So yeah. you guys are all pronouncing it wrong. It's hodlers. Yeah, it was a spelling mistake, I think. <laughs> I mean, some. <laughs> yeah. So I called my I call us hodlers. Um, <laughs> and and so uh, and there's a generation of nouveau hodlers who are gonna get their asses handed to them, in my opinion. That's the that's the process of markets. That's the process. That's what markets do. They do it relentlessly. They did it to the dot-com crazies. They did it to the, the, the tech crazies in 67. They did it to the Japanese crazies in 89. There is always sort of this, this huge group of suckers that are propped up. They're going to get hit. And, and, and it's the normal process. Bitcoin could be on a rocket ship to the moon. But along the way, it's going to be throwing people off constantly. Bear markets toss people off constantly. They're always trying to shake off the enthusiasts constantly. That's the wall of worry, right? When the wall of worry appears not to be there, duck, duck. When, when people I, are not worried, I have a question for duck. you. And sorry for, uh, you know, kind of hijacking the interview, Kevin. Um, but You're not hijacking if there was, <laughs> no, if there was, if there was a, you know, if there was an alien technology that was airdropped on the world and there was a new monetary system that developed from scratch, what would it look like? Oh, it might look like Bitcoin. That's not the doubt, actually. I, I, your technology, your enthusiasm for your technology, everything, it all makes sense to me. I, I don't doubt any of it. I get, I get wound up a little like I, I read stories about Tether. Tether looks like a problem to me. Tether looks like it's part of part of the beatings that you guys could go through. Again, not a lethal beating, but if, if Tether really is, um, as I've been convinced, a, a Ponzi scheme, and to the extent Bitcoin is tied to Tether, you guys are going to have to weather some high seas, I think. Tell me why that's not true. Let's say Tether goes belly up. Tell me why uh, Bitcoin is not going to be hurt by that. Funny, funny enough, um, the you know Bitcoin's at thirty nine thousand or something, and it just kind of isn't it thirty nine now? Why it's well, moving yeah. fast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, um, the the reason that it that it just it just ripped from from thirty two to or thirty four to thirty nine over the last twenty four hours was actually there was um, like billions of dollars of of naked shorts uh, through derivative markets using Tether as collateral. So. So all these, they were naked short selling Bitcoin using Tether that was margined. So, so actually over the last couple of months prior to, or, or you know, contrary to what a lot of Tether truthers are saying, Tether's been suppressing the price. So, well, yes, <laughs> um, but, but so, so look at the equity market. What's the analogy to Tether? It could be GameStop or something like that. Could be the Reddit squad. So, so shares like GameStop and Kodak they had a huge short position and and they were shorted by friends of mine who were convinced they're going to zero one of the problems with a huge short position is you get these wild rallies and so mm -hmm. the, the the fact that there was a huge tether short position means that you can squeeze the crap out of the tether shorts right i get yeah. that but but the question is if tether goes to zero I don't even know what percentage of the Bitcoin world funnels through Tether. I don't really understand stablecoin. I mean, I keep getting asked to these elite podcasts and I can't find my ass with my hands when it comes to Bitcoin. <laughs> so I, all I can do is put up questions. That's it. And so, yeah. so the, 
the hodlers have been pretty gentle with me. Once in a while, some punk will get up there and say, why do you have this guy on? He's a worthless sack of crap. I, I That's the guy I agree with. Um, <laughs> so, but but if te- tell me what happens if Tether turns... It looks to me like Tether's a Ponzi scheme. It looks to me like that it's fraction reserved to an extreme level. At some point, Tether's going to go to zero. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah. So, so what happens so, to Bitcoin? So Tether um, is essentially it's just kind of a money market mutual fund where um, there's, right? there's they have dollar reserves. There's commercial paper backing it. Um, in the, in the event of say a March 2020 where everything gets sells off, well Tether might have a problem, right? Um, and essentially, and, and I don't hold any tether. No, but uh, tether's but, but, mutual fund is holding garbage, though. I think. I, so tether collects dollars. This is like this is like going to a casino and giving a thousand dollars at the window, going it, and playing the crypto world, did. and then coming uh, back to get your. Do- What's that? Has it, been, has, it been, has it ever been audited? I mean, I, well, I don't. Yeah. I, I don't think but so. It's, right. They've been audited. They've been audited, but they they hold backing their you know their quote unquote reserves are commercial paper. So there there obviously is there obviously is risk there. Um, they own crypto. It's 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 sort of owning your own dirty laundry, right? I mean, I, I people should read about Tether carefully, just just so they understand. Just so if if I'm correct and it goes belly up, they don't say, "Oh, I wish someone had told me." It looks to me like Tether was also giving away free Bitcoin to sign up, right? There was all sorts of promotional things. That that money had to come from somewhere. Tether was supposed to be give us a dollar, we'll give you a dollar's worth of Bitcoin spending, and it was supposed to be kind of a, a non-fractional reserve banking system. And it looks like it looks to me like someone's been skimming the hell out of Tether, and there's nothing back in Tether. I think Tether owns yeah. sketchy stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't doubt that Tether owns, you know, probably hot garbage commercial paper. Um, I, th- I think the, the thing is, is you have to like, if you if you think Tether pumps the market, um, which which is a valid concern, and there's a lot of people that are very concerned about this, or you know, maybe places an artificial bid in the crypto Bitcoin markets. Um, well, since April, Bitcoin would pulled back fifty percent, and the Tether. Um, the tether, like the tether balance, the amount of tether out there in circulation has increased, has continued to increase. Stable coins, I think, in aggregate are over a hundred billion dollars. So, like, you know, there, there's it's a systematic thing. Um, you know, if, if there's something wrong with tether or USDC or all of these other stable coins that are occurring, but is it is it systematic against Bitcoin? Where if if tether is you know worthless or there's only oh, 10% in the Bitcoin reserves. sell off did did. Did owners sell to um, to buyers, or did Sorry? did 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 owners did did owner what did owners take possession of as they sold off their Bitcoin? Did they take possession of Tether, or did they take possession of dollar currency? So let's say um, during that sell-off, that what can you trace the money to the point where did, did the money in the sell-off leave the crypto world or did it stay in the crypto world? Uh, actually, so yeah, it's a, that's a pretty good question and it's quite nuanced. Um, but from May nineteenth, uh, which was like you know that big huge flash crash right. we had you know a couple months ago, well, actually there a lot of that. I mean, was obviously panic selling, but a lot of that um, was was basically leverage just being wiped out a lot of on the, the entire bull run you saw you saw traders um lever up with collateralizing bitcoin to long bitcoin which you can so i can with derivative markets and crypto i can i can use stable coin so i can use tether or i can use bitcoin as margin or collateral to to basically long or short any other asset so a bunch of people were long bitcoin with bitcoin w- during the later parts of the run-up so a lot that the you know kind of the protracted sell off was more of a mean reversion than it was you know than it was this this mass uh exodus from from the kind of the crypto space right so so here here's what strikes me as the the risk the real risk so so that that's basically a hermetically sealed system that stayed sealed as I as by your description I think so you've got the you've got the stable coins you got the cryptos you got ether you got you got ten thousand others no one cares about um, and and people are just going in between the cryptos and tether and stable coins and back back again and as a consequence there's a price adjustment within the hermetically sealed system of crypto it seems to me the risk to crypto is when 
money tries to leave that system and you find that you 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 want to cash in your chips at the casino window and they say but we don't have dollars would you like a stable coin instead and people say i want dollars that that's tether's risk to me tether is supposedly so, does the bitcoin gateway, crash on that i think it might yeah I think it might because people want to awesome. get out of Bitcoin. Then they want they want to exit a system for which for which there's not the liquidity. People, people, I don't think, and I could be wrong in this. Eventually, the world you envision it's just a crypto world, right? So the hermetically sealed system is the globe. The world I picture is a, a world where um, people leave the dollar world, go into crypto, and want the ability to go back to the dollar world because they want the ability to go buy the car or, or to buy stock or whatever. Um, if it's if 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 crypto continues to be able to be used for more and more and more things such that the crypto world eventually is itself self-contained and you never have to leave it, then crypto wins. Yeah. If you got to be able to get out the dollars, then then the question is things like then Tether strikes me as a potential complete liquidation. Because I, I think Tether is now fractionally reserved to a fault. And and and. I think it's a Ponzi scheme, and I would argue that our banking system's a Ponzi scheme. So, so I understand that, that right? <laughs> um, the difference is the banking system has the sovereign support, and Tether has a bunch of guys who I don't even know who they are. Do you know who who owns Tether? Do you know who's in charge of Tether? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there definitely could be more transparency for sure, but um, it is now. So, so, so if the run from Tether to dollars fails, that's when that's when you find out what Tether could do to the crypto market. I would, I mean, I would argue that, and, and it's extremely hard, it's, you know, impossible to quantify this, but I would argue that, that the Tether scheme, if you want to call it that, presents, it, it could present a risk to Bitcoin, but it also could present a risk to, to credit markets, right? If there is. Oh, a, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, right. here's, there's an interesting phenomenon here that people seem to miss. Bitcoin is inflationary. I will make that statement. And the reason is, what makes Bitcoin inflationary, I'm not blaming Bitcoin, what makes it inflationary is any time Bitcoin went from scratch, right? So the value of Bitcoin now is the value of the crypto space. One of you is frozen up. Oh, there we go. Crypto went from zero to several trillion, right? Trillion, what's it worth? Uh, cryptos are a trillion? Uh, based on nothing. As a consequence, what it means is there's a new currency that went from zero to, to a trillion. So we now have a trillion more what we'll call money, uh, money nist sometimes people like to call it. And it's like, uh, it's like treasury. So if I own a treasury, it's as good as having money, right? It's as good as if I needed that treasury to spend, to buy something, I could do it. And so, the fa so crypto introduced basically a trillion dollars more currency into the system. Now, the reason I point that out is because... Um, Everything is sort of like that. My house is potentially inflationary to the extent that if I can, if, if my house doubles in purchase price, it's the same house, it's the same location, it's the same wood, it's the same pipes, but it's double the purchase price, I can spend some of that. And so that, that's, I, I, right, take out home equity. That's what we were told in 07, 08, right? That, oh, take <laughs> equity out of your home. That equity is an artificial equity. I didn't have equity in my home. I, it's the same home. It's not like my house is growing. Oh, look, we've got a new bedroom. Who, who, who could have figured, right? That It wasn't there last year, right? It's the same house, but it became worth more, and therefore produced a kind of a spending power. And that's a Federal Reserve endorsement, right? They love that. That's the wealth effect. So uh, I'm just, that's just a, a note. So Bitcoin is inflationary to the extent it introduces the, the total volume of moneyness in the system. I, I would say maybe as a counterpoint that, Starting in 2009, January 3rd, the day the protocol launched, the terminal inflation rate of Bitcoin is zero, um, even though there is a kind of an a, a, like asymmetric, uh, you know, supply issuance or uh, not asymmetric, uh, asym asymptotic uh, supply issuance. But the, the monetization process of Bitcoin going from a zero to a trillion and, you know, 700 billion or whatever it is today is just the preferences of of of, I guess, like value of subjective value around the world changing. So you're correct about five... that. But, but your preference went from zero to a trillion. And, and, it, and the trillion dollars in no way extinguished other money, right? 
the dollars that were used to buy Bitcoin are still in circulation. They're still out there. And so in, in some sense, what asset bubbles do is they produce they produce a sort of a liquidity. And, and it's not there's this stupid flow model. They say money flows from Bitcoin into this, into that. It, money doesn't flow. Like you said, it's a preference. So if I buy a stock, someone else sold it. Money didn't flow into stocks. But there's no flow. Preference there's no exchange. valve. There's no entryway. It just, it's just yeah. if I want, if, if collectively society wants to be, instead of 60-40, wants to be 80-20, then stocks get bid up. The denominator doesn't change. There's still the same amount of cash in the system. So you just bid them up until you're 80-20. And by the way, there was no net change in, in real worth. There's no net change. So... So the wealth effect is envisioned by the Fed is really a leveraging of the system such that people perceive they have more value, even though we've created nothing in the process. And so in some sense, that's what Bitcoin is. I, again, I'm not blaming Bitcoin. And it could be that, that, that there's a countering last, la, lack of preference for the dollar. So if a dollar's worth a trillion dollars less, then, then it's a wash, right? You still got the same amount of moneyness in the system. Yeah, I mean, I think the, just the fact that like Bitcoin is, you know, it's denominated, the price is denominated in dollars. So like, you know, uh, there is um, there is an argument there that um, like, you know, during an everything bubble collapse, Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin nominal, the nominal value or price of Bitcoin is going to get crushed just like it did in March. I have no and, idea. And, and I'm, you know, and, that, sure and I, I believe that. Okay. Um, but I think what you, what you have in, you know, this in, intolerant minority of, of, of cultists, these laser eyed cultists, I think, uh, I know personally, there's myself included, I'm a buyer at any price and I have been right. for, for a few years. And, I, and, and there's also, you know, there's that at a, a small retail level. There's that you see, you know, Michael Saylor buying a billion dollars at 58,000 saying our, our stated goal is to acquire more Bitcoin regard dollar price to be damned. You also have people selling energy to the grid for Bitcoin denominated um, units. And so I think, you know, regardless of price, there's going to be, there's a real value of Bitcoin because of one, the, the monetary assurances of the protocol or of this, you know, of this monetary asset. People, I, I trust math rather than politicians and that won't change. And so, you know, regardless of anything rather than politicians. Correct. I mean, I'm <laughs> going to pick a, I'm going to pick a sailor here. Sa sailors like the, the God, but here's a guy who ran a company that supposedly created wealth, and now he's turned it into a Bitcoin company. This is a strange world. So I, when Saylor gets up and he's all bullish about Bitcoin, I go, I, I'm glad that S Steve Jobs didn't do that because then we wouldn't have the iPhone or the iPad or whatever. Saylor is now running a hedge fund out of what used to be, a, in theory, a wealth-creating company. And, and well, He's still creating wealth, no? Is he not? He still sells no, enterprise, no, business he's, enterprise he's, software. No, he's, he's creating a cash flow of thirty million dollars per year. Well, yeah, but but what he's really doing is 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 playing the Bitcoin market or a speculative so really, attack on the U.S. dollar. What's that? Or a speculative attack on the U.S. dollar on the on the dollar. Yeah, that's right. But 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 what would his earnings be if you took away the Bitcoin gains? Like Elon Musk, same thing. Hmm. Elon's trading Bitcoin to hide the fact that he can't make a car to make make a profit. <laughs> Elon can't make cars at a profit. If you take away his Bitcoin sales, you take away his games that he plays with Twitter and gets away with murder. Gets away with murder. In terms, if Bitcoin was regulated, he'd be in prison in theory. But, but, but he also then gets carbon credits from the government, which I yeah. hate. Governmental If subsidies. you take away the carbon credits, you take yeah. away the Bitcoin trading, Elon Musk would be getting auctioned off on the courthouse steps. He has brilliantly turned market cap, this kind of inflation I was talking about, into a way to sell shares to gullible investors who somehow think, oh, he's printing shares, but I don't care. Um, he's been able to, to do all these scams to hide the fact that he can't make a car for a profit. And so this is not good news for capitalism. Sailor, I don't think is good news for capitalism. Now, he might be great for news for Bitcoin. But Saylor is not making his money creating wealth, making the world a better place except through Bitcoin, which you guys love. But um, I wrote a whole section last year, about 25 pages on wealth creation. Wealth aggregation is not the same as wealth creation. Warren Buffett doesn't create wealth. He aggregates it. Um, 
uh, uh, Steve Jobs created wealth. He invented stuff that changed the world. Microsoft kind of creates wealth, but he, it's kind of a it's kind of a commoditized process now. Um, and and a lot of these tech companies, I don't think, are great wealth creators, despite the fact that people who own their shares think they are. I think Netflix is a piece of garbage. I think uh, I think. Uh, uh, you know, when they booted Pfizer out of the Dow and put in, put in, in what's that one? Jesus Christ, senior moment. Um, the cloud computing company, come on. Salesforce? My, yeah, 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 yeah. Salesforce.com. Salesforce.com, if you read articles from two or three years ago, they were on the rocks. And now they're in the Dow. I, I don't know what's going on in this world. So, in, would you say that, would the, you say that Bitcoin is, is, I would say that Bitcoin is capital accumulation. Do you disagree? No, I agree with that. Right now, so, it could be capital, not accumulation later, but yeah, I agree. It's capital accumulation. Yeah, it's so not think, cap. It's not. It's not wealth creation. No, I, and I, I right. would say, and, like, I think Michael Saylor just, you know, despite all of the, you know, all the podcasts, and he, he definitely is a, a loud proponent for sure. Um, but I think how he looks at it, at, at a, you know, at a billion dollar scale, how I look at it, at not a billion dollar scale, and how many, an increasing amount of people do, is that. Bitcoin, and they, you know, it's kind of a meme, but like one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. A lot of people, dollar volatility aside, are, are choosing to accumulate capital and savings in this asset. And so, right. But, and, but and here for here's the analogy: um, the 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 Japanese real estate market was going nuts in the '80s because of their 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 credit bubble, and the companies became so obsessed with their real estate, they stopped creating wealth. And so they were measuring their net worth based on the, the, the value of the real estate. And that drove the bubble up to 1989. And 30 years later, they have not recovered from that mess. So when you have people who are charged with, by society charged with, or are supposedly the ones creating wealth, start, um, start instead treating themselves as just wealth accumulators. We're, we could be at the end. And Saylor, for example, the question is, what would happen to his company if he had no gains from Bitcoin? Because his company's floating on, he's, he's a hedge fund. If he wants to be a hedge fund, that's fine. But I don't think hedge funds create wealth either. Wealth is created by guys who think of things and invent things and produce things and, and you know, stuff that hurts when you drop it on your foot. You can write some code. I'm okay with that, right? That doesn't hurt either when you drop it on your foot. But um, but 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 Saylor's not a great example because he, he's just he really to me is just a homo. And so he's, so uh, let me let me his like company kind of looks a like a shadow. It looks like a shadow to me. But I don't know what his cash flow is, so I, I could be wrong about that too. If there's a if there's a Turkish company who for thirty years saved in the lira, and I understand you know the, this analogy is a little stretched maybe, but and in, and one day they decide to take I mean, MicroStrategy had. I think 15 years of retained earnings on their balance sheet, sitting on $500 million of cash. And Michael Saylor right. after March of 2020 said, we don't want to sit in treasury bonds. We think the CPI inflation rate is garbage. We were, we're looking at equities. We're looking at real estate. We're looking at gold. We're looking at Bitcoin. We're looking at all avenues. And they said, we're going to choose to, to go on to a Bitcoin standard, meaning we're going to denominate our cash flows and all this stuff, even though there's, you know, with the, you know, gap accounting, it's, it's, you know, Bitcoin's an intangible asset on the balance sheet. We're gonna right. we're gonna choose to accumulate Bitcoin. That's gonna be our strategy. Whereas, you know, in, if you're in a developing nation and they said instead of liras, we're gonna try to, regardless of exchange rate, we're gonna acquire dollars. And the Turkish lira, you know, plummeted against the dollar, and that company's stock exploded on the stock exchange. Is that is that? You know, are they speculating or being irresponsible? Or are they just switching their unit of account into something that they believe in? Well, they're switching their unit of account. But what the mistake you would make is to buy the shares thinking they're a highly functional company. So so, so that's a one-off gain potentially, right? So if, if you think, if, if, if you think like a gold company could, could, could discover a huge vein of gold and dig it out and make a lot of money. But you got to look forward and say, what's going to happen going forward? And, and the question is, is sailors gain just a one-off? It's smart to be in Bitcoin. It turns out retrospectively, it was smart to be in Bitcoin instead of the dollar. I get that. And, and in fact, the interesting thing is I've written about stock buybacks as an evil scourge. 
not that they can't work in principle, but in practice, they, they work very poorly, in my opinion. Uh, but what it, they represent also is a, um, is a reach for yield. So companies didn't have the incentive to buy back stocks when, um, when liquid assets on their balance sheets had a positive return. Now that liquid assets on their balance sheets have a, have a negative return, why not buy back stock and pump your stock? And, but, but the, again, this is the end of capitalism. This is yeah, not a good sign. Do you think, Dave, that's also an ethical question? Because I think it's, um, it is the ethical thing to do to, you know, when you have 15%, 15 to 20% debasement of, you know, the dominating reserve currency, which is a US dollar, putting into Bitcoin instead of buy, you know. Buy I have no, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that. But, but what bothers me is, again, it's not about the ethics of it. It's about um, it's about when our capitalists are focusing on currency trading, then we've got a problem. Yeah, I, wanna, I mean, I think like I, I, a sailor should be focusing on tech development, right? He shouldn't have the fact that he has to go to Bitcoin is a bad sign. I, I agree going to Bitcoin was a great move. But, but the fact that he had to and, and again, if you want to price micro strategy going forward, Now it's a Bitcoin analysis. It's no longer micro strategy analysis. And, and, uh, and, and so he's, he's not a capitalist anymore. He's, a, he's more of a, a hedge fund. Yeah, I don't have an insight you know, into micro strategies business. Like, you know, well, I don't either. I, I'm speaking you know, out of my ass on this. Software, you know. But I do know he made a lot of money on Bitcoin. Yeah, of course. Right. And, and I do know that Elon made a lot of money on Bitcoin. And I do know that his earnings would be negative if he wasn't playing all these right. games. Well, and again, Elon when the guys sold, are right? Still- Elon sold and realized some, some gains as, as Sailor. Yeah. And he's levered up and borrowed a bunch of money, unsecured, secure. He's, he had, you know, convertible notes, all this stuff, seven years out with a 50 basis point uh, coupon. He's never realized any gains. And he said, But and he, that's a flaw. You know, that shows you the flaw in the system. That does show you, that underscores, I, I'm not getting it. This is no longer about Bitcoin. This is about capitalism yeah. going down the tubes. When he can borrow at 50 basis points to buy Bitcoin instead of running a goddamn company, we've got a problem. Mm-hmm. Right? He's yeah, putting all I mean, his intellectual energy into crypto. He's not supposed to be doing that in a good capitalist system. A stable yeah, I think, monetary I think with- system would allow him to not have to worry about that. I mean, we're obviously, I mean, and like we're from Sailor's point of view, he thinks we're in, yeah, he thinks, you know, his time is, is, is well spent educating the world on a problem that he sees and you can debate the merits of that. But, um, you know, there is a problem when Apple has $200 billion dollars of cash in their balance sheet and they borrow 40 years out at 200 basis points and I billions agree. of dollars to buy back their stock, right? Like, I and, and why, totally why are they borrowing? And they're borrowing to buy back their stock because they can borrow from the Fed who was literally buying Apple bonds earlier in the year um, because they can borrow for less than the cost of capital. And so, you know, is Sailor, some people say it's irresponsible. Some people say it's, it's you know, extremely prudent. Now, and there's a I whole don't spectrum think it's irres- there. Well, if he's levering Bitcoin, if he's levering Bitcoin, it, it, it could easily cross the irresponsible, right? If, if you're levering Bitcoin, you could be putting all of your shareholders at great risk. I'm not qualified to know, but 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 now he's playing a, a double down, double or nothing, all in Texas Hold'em strategy. And and he has a, a responsibility to his shareholders to do the right thing. And if that's not really the right thing, then he's blowing it. If that's the right thing, then, you know, he's fine. But he's, he's not, he's not a tech company anymore. He's a Bitcoin company. And, 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 uh, and again, In some sense, we've just circled back to explain, to agree that the system's so screwed up. Yeah. But now we've got CEOs who are trading Bitcoin instead of making stuff. Yeah. And we've got people, we've got huge companies, uh, cor- corporate. I just saw that. I just saw the zombie plot again, the zombie plot, just in case your hodlers have not paid attention to the history of markets. A zombie company is a company that, that, that can't pay its interest rate mm-hmm. with its cash flow. Yeah. which means it's really submerging. It's, it's heading for the courthouse steps to be auctioned yeah. off. Because By the way, in Germany, it, it, we have, uh, in Germany, I mean, Austria, but in Germany, there are 800,000 zombified companies. Right. So in really the US S&P 500, 20% of the companies, 100 of the companies are zombies with interest rates at so stupidly low levels, 4,000 year lows, 
they still can't pay off the interest. Back in 1990 or something, um, when interest rates were 10%, there were only 2% zombies. So we've gone from 2% to 20% when interest rates went from 10 to zero, near zero. And so we've got 20% of the S&P that looks like it is going to die. This is, this is such a bad situation. I get the Bitcoin concern. I, I get the gold holders. I get, I get the guys who are panicking like crazy trying to protect themselves from this crazy system. But I, I also am troubled when CEOs of major companies are, are trading Bitcoin to keep their companies flowing. Yeah. It, it seems like it's so how do we how do we bring back creative destruction? That's the question. That's the uh, hundred trillion back. dollar question. It'll bring itself back. I, yeah. I am confident it'll bring itself back. So I'm confident the Fed is a bunch of incompetence, and that they've been able to pull off something only through brute force of monetary policy of, of an unimaginably bad level. And I'm convinced. I'm convinced there are forces of nature in the market. Uh, the thermodynamics common of sailor, I don't understand in terms of Bitcoin. I do understand in terms of market. The mar market's going to regress to the mean. And it's going to be so painful. And then I was going to say, no one saw this coming. And th there's going to be a thousand of us or 10,000 or 100,000 who said, yeah, we did. We saw it coming the whole way, you idiots. I think the Federal Reserve could not be more feckless and incompetent. I, I, maybe they're just so terrified. They say, look, we've got stage four cancer. We're going to that medicine maker in Indonesia to try to get cured. Maybe, maybe they've got just no ideas left whatsoever. But they, they could have done stuff along the way. It started with Greenspan, and it just got worse and worse and worse. So, so from Greenspan forward, monetary policy went off the rails. They could have sobered up the system. They chose not to. So, and so now we're at the precipice. Right. The Bitcoiners so think they have the solution. The gold guys think they have the solution. Some own both. So let's get back to Bitcoin. I mean, uh, let's say, you know, my final question to you guys, um, you know, let's say it's 2024, you know, because it's the next halving, uh, the block subsidy is going to be halved again. So it's going to be a supply shock. And by that time, there's, you know, estimates by other people. They say, you know, a billion people are going to be adopting Bitcoin. So Dylan, uh, with all that, with all those conditions, and and Dave, like, would you would you then reconsider, uh, Dave, your position? Your <laughs> well, if I believe those numbers, I would reconsider. I have no idea where those projections come from. Okay. I, I know where the projections of the 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 uh, the Bitcoin production come from. I, mm -hmm. I I don't technically, but I do know that they're there. I do know there's hard stops all along the way. Um, the number of people endorsing Bitcoin, as we talked about earlier in the hour, um, we don't know if by then the sovereigns will have stepped in and squashed them like bugs, right? If I thought Bitcoin was going to be able to just run free, I'd be fine. It really is the politics of Bitcoin that that keeps me from getting into it. And people say, oh, why not just buy 3%? Because 3% is not going to be life-changing either. You guys, I, you can tell me it's going to be. And then I get the, I get the line, oh, you know, you're losing so much money. I go, I'm not losing anything. But I, zero I, is the wrong answer. Not. Zero percent What's is the wrong answer. Well, like, it might like be, but, 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 but I know. And Greg says he's going to come and make me do it. <laughs> um, but, but, but the quantity, the quantity, I own like 10 salaries of gold, right? So my bet on gold is very, very real. And, and for, for, if I take a 3% position in Bitcoin, it's like this earworm that it's not going to change my life in all probably, in my opinion. You guys think maybe it would. But it's, you know, and as Greg said, well, it's only 3% of your worth. Why not? And I go, because I, it's just an annoyance. I, 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 it, 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 I don't need to be worrying about whether I'm a dumbass. And I'm, I'm happy to be a dumbass missing an opportunity. Yeah, uh, that's that's the difference. I, I don't mind missing the opportunity. I I, I I I hate to make stupid decisions. You guys think not buying is a stupid decision. But for me, a three percent, three percent is like an annual salary for me right now. Right. Right. And so, and I mean, and you agree on if the you do a little quick arithmetic, you realize all I have to do is not screw up and I'm yeah. fine. You know, the structural mm -hmm. criminality, fraud, you know, fraud, I mean, systemic theft. Um, I do believe, yeah, right. We we agree on this. So, 
you know, to wrap this up, Dave, I mean, is there any like light at the end of the tunnel that you see? Because we have one shot at this and I think I'm pretty sure, you know, Dylan would agree with me, right? <laughs> we have one shot at this. If we don't fuck this up, you know, if we fuck this up, you know, we have no, no future. <laughs> you mean if you fucked up the crypto or if you fuck up, I'm not sure it's going to work out as dire as you think. I, I, you know, I think okay. the system's going to have us come to Jesus moment, but the wealth of, say, the United States, let's, let's just focus on that because I live here and I think Dylan lives here, um, is, is the education of the populace, which, by the way, is not as good as some people think, um, the, the, the productive assets that we have and various things like that. That's our wealth, our, our, our ability to create wealth and the wealth we've created. We've got huge real estate. We've got huge natural resources. And that doesn't ever go to zero. That, that is who we are. Um, and, and, and that is our wealth. And the, the rest is just some denomination of it. And so, so we won't go to zero. And the question is, is when the, when the battle's over and the soldiers are laying all over the battlefield, who's going to be walking around picking up, you know, taking the wallets off the soldiers, the dead soldiers, and taking their rings and ripping out their fillings and, you know, stuff like that. And, and it could be Bitcoin and gold holders, right? I, I just don't know. Could be guys who own, you know, equities. Could be owning Apple stock is going to be the way to protect yourself. I just don't know. It's not going to be bond holders, no. long-term, long-duration bond holders. It's not going to be, I don't think it's going to be indexing equity holders. I, 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 no. I, it's stock pickers. When, you know, when they say a, a market is a stock picker's market, you know what that means is it means you're screwed. That's code for you're screwed. It's a stock picker's market because they're about to say, oh, by the way, I picked the wrong ones. Sorry. Yeah. So I agree with you guys 100%, except for, you know, Bitcoin doesn't interest me because of these, you know, I might just be too old school. You guys should just not worry about me. The, the We're hodlers, worried about you, Dave. We're worried about oh, you, man. I, I, you know, just, I'll tell you what, I'll set up a GoFundMe site if I need it. You <laughs> Send, send me all that newfound wealth. You'll all be so stinking rich and say, look, you know, remember Dave, he's out there begging with a tin cup, you know? So uh, <laughs> no, if, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm screwed, if I'm screwed, the average boomers toast. Yeah. I, if, oh, if I'm in trouble, the average boomers toast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the reason I, I invited you because you have such a spectrum of, of, you know, perspectives on so many topics. And I think you have a more holistic or a critical line of thinking and perspective. This is why it's so important, I think, to bring you in always into this Bitcoin as Preston, you know, Preston Pish did or, you know, many others going to do a Marty Band. So, um, yeah, uh, Dylan, I mean, what's your conclusion after this discussion? Yeah, Dave's a nut. Yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> I mean it's, it's a crazy world. And, I, you know, I really respect you, Dave, and all of it, you know, the perspective you bring. Um, you know, we, we have different conclusions as of now, um, but, you know, maybe maybe not so in the future. So, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, chatting and, and this convo. Okay. You want to give any shout out or uh, where we can find you, Dylan, Dave, Dylan, where can we find you? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I work for, for Bitcoin Magazine doing some stuff with financial markets. Um, you can just follow me on Twitter, um, Dylan LeClaire, at BTC is Asian, Bitcoinization, <laughs> hyper Bitcoinization is coming. <laughs> All right, Dave. send me a send me a link or something. I'm not going to remember at BTization. What is that? I can I can uh, I can put in the chat or something. Yeah, at, I think at, I the the chat to um, his, his BTization. Yeah, BTC I Z A T I O N. Okay, okay, okay. Well, um, okay. Dave, you write a quarterly uh, blog letter. Is that quarterly? yearly? Yearly. Yearly. Okay. Okay. Is there anything coming? Two hundred pages. Yeah. At the end of the year, there'll be one. Two hundred. Um, two hundred pages. <laughs> you want You want to know what busting your balls is? Busting your balls is having to write a two hundred page annual review, which you don't get to write during the year because it's not over yet. So you wouldn't believe the zone I get in in November, early December. To bang wow. out 200 pages and you know i mentioned bitcoin here and there depending on how interesting the year was and of gold and then i talk about social issues that uh that have my attention and they they seem to be increasingly problematic to me so um so i'll i'll call out the bad guys 200 pages worth of um smuggling in snide remarks and and uh, i think it's pretty funny 
gets read very high places. Larry Summers told me he read it. That's that's yeah. pretty good. So and so I got right into the middle of the topics. Death Star with that one. Right into the Death Star. Yeah, and you know you write about topics that are called you know, allegedly whatever t taboo topics or even yeah <laughs> yeah I go out on a limb. Yeah, and that's good. You know I think we need people like you. So Dave, thank you so much. I really appreciate Dylan. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time, and hope we can repeat this. Yeah. This was yeah. fun. Till next time. Till next you really time. guys yeah. did rock today. You got thirty nine thousand. Oh moly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I should have bought it yesterday, right? Never too late, dude. <laughs> yeah. A little bit every Sometimes day. Sometimes it is. Okay. <laughs> I'm still buying Kodak shares. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.